Hello, everybody. My name is Cable Green. I'm the Director of Global Learning for Creative Commons, and we'll get more into what Creative Commons is later. It's a real honor to be asked to be one of the keynotes at this uh, esteemed conference. I uh, thank Steve uh, for his assistance in getting me set up and moderating and making sure that we stay on time. We've got about an hour, so I'm going to move quickly, uh, very quickly through the slides, and then my goal is to have lots of time to do some Q&A. So please do type your messages in the chat window, and uh, Steve uh, or one of our moderators will keep an eye on those, uh, and, uh, and we'll uh, probably open up the mics uh, toward the end so that you can ask questions. Let me turn it over to you, Steve. Thanks, Cable. So delighted to have you here. Special thanks also to our sponsors, partners, and especially our international advisory board and chairs who've done a terrific job in helping with the conference. Uh, IEARN is our founding sponsor for the conference, and we really appreciate their help, as the help of others listed on that slide. This is your chance to let us know where you're participating from. To the left of the map, look for a star icon. Click on that, and then click on the map. It's also fun if you shout out in the chat the city, the country, time, temperature. I'm in now snowy Park City, Utah. Looks like we may have had an international guest, but this is a surprisingly North America-centric audience. Cable, I'll be interested to know if Creative Commons is as well known outside of the U.S. as it is in the U.S., and, and um, we'll look for that maybe in your remarks or at some point in the Q&A. You bet. I think I hit that uh, in the discussion. We, in fact, uh, have 71 and growing uh, Creative Commons affiliates around the world, and each one of those affiliates is in a different country, and the licenses are actually ported into 55 legal jurisdictions, so we're all over the place. That is terrific. Okay, I'm going to turn things back to you, Cable. Thanks again so much for being here. Okay, thanks, Steve. And uh, first of all, let me just point out that these slides are up on slideshare.net. Uh, the last, I gave this uh, talk at the Sloan conference last week, and they're the same slides, so I didn't upload them twice. If you just go to slideshare.net slash cgreen, you'll find them. You can download them, and they have a Creative Commons attribution license on them, which means you are, uh, for, they are free, and you are legally entitled to do whatever you want with them. All you have to do is say that these came from Cable Green at Creative Commons. You can sell them, mix them up, uh, do whatever you like. So uh, today's talk is, let me back up <coughs> the slides here, it's called The Obviousness of Open Policy. And the reason I called it that is I really do believe that uh, this simple idea um, that we'll discuss is obvious. And open, the simple idea of open policy is that when public funds are used, that the public that paid for those uh, funds should have free uh, and open access to it. And uh, I'm going to do my best to convince uh, all of us that that, in fact, is a good idea. Oh, and before I continue, Steve, it looks like your mic is still on. I'll make sure we're not getting any feedback. So let me go ahead and, and move forward. Uh, so first, some things in life uh, are obvious. Um, and here's just a few uh, fun slides that I found out on Flickr that all have Creative Commons license on them. I actually walked into a hotel room recently that had this on it as if didn't know what that was. I like to hike, but I, think I know it's a meadow. This one I thought especially important for these times. This one's my favorite. If you can't read that, it says, no diving, shallow water. I like this one. And then for our friends from England, in case you didn't know, that's a grassy knoll. So some things in life are obvious. Some things in life are both obvious and important. So um, according to the World Food Program, there are 925 million undernourished people in the world today. That means that one in seven people don't have enough food to eat. So the question I've got for all of us is, 
If we had a food machine that could feed everybody on the planet and the marginal cost of feeding everybody was close to zero, and it didn't hurt any farmers, didn't hurt anybody's uh, ability to make a living, and the net result of turning on that food machine is that everybody in the world has enough to eat, the question is, should we turn on the food machine? So let's use our, our voting here uh, in, uh, in the tool and uh, vote yes if you think we should turn on the food machine, and you can click on the red X if uh, no, you think we should leave the food machine off and let uh, one out of seven people starve. So um, obvious, yes, we would turn on the food machine tomorrow if the marginal cost of doing so was zero. So the point of this discussion is I believe that what we have is not a food machine in front of us today, but in fact we have a learning machine, and it's within our power to turn it on, but it needs public open policies to provide ongoing sustainable funding uh, for us to get there. So I have a very simple dream, and this is why I do the job that I do, and my education dream is that everybody in the world can attain all of the education that they desire. But if we're going to get there, it's going to require that we share our educational resources that we produce and that we spend our limited public funds wisely. And the world needs this dream to come true and come true quickly if we're going to meet the global demand for higher or tertiary education, as it's called around the world. Uh, many of you have probably seen Sir John Daniel speak. He's the CEO of the Commonwealth of Learning, and I'll let you read this quote. But what do you think the odds are that the world is going to build four major universities at 30,000 students each to open every week for the next 15 years? Just how, how likely do you think that is to happen? And, and most of us would say um, not very likely at all. And in fact, what we need to be doing is aggressively looking for other solutions to meet that, that significant global demand. So the good news is this isn't just my dream. <clears throat> Many people have this dream, and this dream has been going on now for roughly a decade. Uh, in 2006, Kathy Casserly and Mike Smith of the Hewlett Foundation wrote, and I quote, at the heart of the movement toward open educational resources is the simple and powerful idea that the world's knowledge is a public good and that technology in general and the web in particular provide an opportunity for everyone to share and reuse it, end quote. So they were thinking about this, and the good news is there continue to be folks at Hewlett that carry on the same dream and fund it. But it's not just Hewlett. There's the Open Society Foundation, Shuttleworth, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is getting not only into direct funding of open educational resources, but uh, specifically they are starting to do what Hewlett does, which is in their next-gen learning challenges, to require Creative Commons attribution licensing on all the products produced. Our friend David Wiley, uh, who many of you know, who reminds us that if we're not sharing, we're not teaching. UNESCO and the other IGOs are getting into this. UNESCO, of course, in 2002 um, held a big conference, and their participants expressed, quote, the wish to develop together a universal education resource for the whole of humanity. And UNESCO next summer in Paris is having a, a global OER conference. Another IGO that's in the game is OECD. Um, they have an OER project that's really exploring what, what, why is OER happening and, uh, and, and what do we need to know about it so that we can help to stoke the fires underneath it. <clears throat> Creative Commons, where I work, somebody mentioned Darth Vader earlier, so um, I hope that you like the Stormtrooper under the CC paraphernalia here. Our job and what we've done for 10 years is to make it easy for creators to share, creators of music, creators of art, creators of museum works, creators of textbooks, of videos, of you name it. If it's a creative work that can be copyrighted, um, Creative Commons uh, is a tool that can be used to share uh, some of your rights while still protecting your copyright. And why do we do this? Creative Commons is in the business of helping people realize the full potential of the Internet, universal access to research, education, and full participation in culture so that we can collectively drive a new era of development, growth, and productivity. So that's our kind of catchphrase. <clears throat> what, what is Creative Commons? Well, CC licenses, when I say CC, I mean Creative Commons, makes it easy and legal to share your stuff. And we all know that the core part of any open educational resources definition um, is that the educational resource is either A, openly licensed, or B, is in the public domain. 
And why are those things so important? So that anybody can do what David Wiley calls the four R's, reuse, revise, remix, or redistribute. If you're not able to do those things, then you really don't have full access to the resource in a way that you might need to in order to change it to, to meet your needs. Uh, of course, open license is key to any definition of, of OER, and this is the definition that I tend to use. So we're not just talking about free as in free beer. So we are. It, it's free cost. It doesn't. You're not going to charge me any money to use this thing, but it's also free as in freedom or free as in libre. So you have the free and legal rights to modify it, to change it, et cetera. So again, there are uh, many more foundations that are in on this. <clears throat> you may have seen this morning, sailor.org announced their second wave of uh, textbook reward money. So basically, if you've got a textbook and you're willing to uh, open it up with an open license, Sailor will give you a $25,000 reward for doing so. So for all you faculty out there who have textbooks that uh, never did sell, maybe here's an opportunity to, uh, to cash in and do some good at the same time. The Open Courseware Consortium, another one, envisions a world in which the desire to learn is fully met by the opportunity to do so anywhere in the world by anyone. The Cape Town Declaration, if you haven't read this document, um, maybe somebody could type in the web address for Cape Town Declaration. Uh, but it begins with this one sentence, which has inspired me to do this kind of work. It says, we are in the cusp, or we are on the cusp of a global revolution in teaching and learning. And educators worldwide are developing a vast pool of educational resources on the Internet, open and free for all to use. These educators are creating a world where each and every person on Earth can access and contribute to the sum of all human knowledge. So not just access. So it's not just about I'm going to take this free stuff and modify it and, and make good use of it. And while we absolutely want people to do that, that's fantastic. It's also I'm going to give back. So I'm going to contribute to the sum of all human knowledge. Our friends and our open access colleagues uh, like Spark and Right to Research and all the universities and the libraries and librarians and faculty who share their creative works, we say thank you because these folks are working to, to return scholarly publishing to its original purpose, which is to spread knowledge and allow that knowledge be able to be built upon. And there, this list goes on and on and on. We don't have enough time or enough slides in a PowerPoint deck to list everybody, um, but what's important to know is that all these organizations share a common dream, and that common dream is that everyone everywhere is able to access affordable, educationally and culturally appropriate opportunities to gain whatever knowledge or training or educational opportunities that they desire. That's what we share in common, and so it's a, it's a fun group to work with. Okay, so to the point of the talk, that was just a little bit of um, a little bit of let's get everybody up to speed. So, so all sounds great, right? What's the problem? Well, we've got a major policy problem, and our policy problem is that most policymakers don't understand the 21st century technical and legal tools and how they can collectively be used to turn on this learning machine that we've got. So, understanding the opportunity that's afforded by wielding these tools is key to understanding that this education dream is possible. And without understanding all these tools, and more importantly, how these tools mix together, policymakers can only make decisions within the existing frameworks and the existing business models that they understand. So what are these, what are these tools that they need to know about? Well, we, we all know. I mean, if you're in this conference, you probably have a pretty good idea of what these tools are. We know that there's the Internet. We know the affordances of digital things, that <clears throat> it costs essentially nothing to store, nothing to distribute over the Internet, and it costs nothing to make a million or a billion or 10 billion copies of something. Um, yes, there's a cost, but it's very, very small, as we'll show in just a minute. We know that hardware costs are falling. We know that bandwidth speeds are going up. We know that mobility is going up globally. We know that there's creative commons, that there's ability to openly license your works. And we also know, just from our own experience, that there's sort of this mass willingness to want to share information. It's most um, kind of explicitly expressed in social networking. But when people have the ability and the empower and they're empowered to share, they tend to share. 
And so we understand that collectively we could actually turn on the learning machine with all these pieces, but it's not enough that you and I know this. We have to help our policymakers understand these points as well. So what about that, that very low cost? Well, here's the, um, these are some numbers that David Wiley ran. He asked the question, for a 250-page textbook, if I wanted somebody to copy those pages by hand, so, so go back two, three hundred years, uh, what would the cost be? Well, in today's dollars, it would be about $1,000. Well, that's no good, right? That's, that's a lot more than a textbook costs today. So we'll throw that one out. Uh, what if we wanted to take an open textbook, one that you're not going to charge me licensing fees for, um, but we wanted to do print on demand. So we're going to give it to Lulu or Coop or we're going to print it in our local bookstore. That costs just under $5. And what if you want to copy it uh, from a computer? So I've got the 250-page textbook. It's, I don't know, 50 megs on my hard drive, and I want to copy it and give you a copy. It costs .00084 cents. And so that's approximately the, the cost of the copy. How much does it cost to distribute? Again, you can see the numbers here. In fact, the cost of distribution plus the cop, cop, pop, da, da. the cost of distribution plus the cost of print on demand, uh, David in, in his uh, work in Utah has got that down to approximately five dollars and thirty five cents. That includes shipping and handling and a three hundred page textbook, all for about five bucks. Um, of course, if you don't want to do print on demand, the cost of distributing on the internet. Point zero 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 seven two. These numbers come off Amazon's uh, cloud site for how much it costs uh, to, to store a 250-page textbook. So, you know, we understand these these affordances, and we're going to have to help policymakers understand it if they're going to realize not only these massive cost savings, but more important, we need to stop spending money in the ways that we're spending money today. And we need to reallocate those funds to higher value things like hiring more faculty and lowering uh, hiring more teachers and lowering classroom ratios and providing more professional development opportunities and better technology suites and better hardware for folks and more access to higher education and lowering tuition. And there's all sorts of better things that we could do with money than what the way we currently spend it. So one of the important concepts to understand is this concept of rivalrous versus non-rivalrous resources. So think about um, anything that's analog or anything that's made out of atoms uh, as being rivalrous. So this newspaper in the upper left, if you take the newspaper from in front of my house in the morning, I no longer have my newspaper, right? Only one of us can have it at the same time. It's a rivalrous resource. On the other hand, if we both wanted to go to, say, the New York Times website or the Seattle Times website that I read every morning, um, it's not rivalrous, right? And a million people can be on the Seattle Times website all at the same time. Why? Because it's digital and it's on the Internet, and the marginal cost of sharing that over the Internet is, is very, very close to zero. Of course, we can apply these same principles to educational resources if we're smart. So let me interject real quickly just about uh, why Creative Commons uh, is in this game and why we're interested and why do I work at Creative Commons around these particular topics. Well, Creative Commons, again, is just a simple standardized way for you, the copyright holder, to be clear about which permissions you're sharing with others and under what conditions. And very simply, you just go to creativecommons.org, you click on choose a license, it asks you two questions. And the questions get at these four uh, these four conditions. Uh, every, all of our licenses require attribution. So if somebody uses your stuff, they have to give you credit for it. You decide whether or not it's non-commercial or not. So that means are you going to allow somebody to use your thing, whatever it is you shared, uh, and make money uh, on it? And you get to choose, yes or no. A lot of people are okay with it. They say, I don't care. If somebody can make money on this and improve it, knock yourself out. There's still a free version available. Uh, others say, no, I'm, I'm really against that. But again, this is a personal choice. Uh, the share alike clause is what Wikipedia uses. The share alike clause says, if you take my work and you modify it, that you must share forward with the rest of the world, not only my original work, but you have to share your changes forward as well under the same license that my work was licensed under. So this is what Wikipedia uses because, of course, if you think about Wikipedia, you go and you modify an article, your changes in that article have to be allowed to be carried forward so that other people can build upon your work. So a lot of people use an attribution plus a share alike license. That's a very common combination. 
Uh, and then the last option is no derivative works. And this essentially means um, you can use my work, but you can't make any money. I'm sorry, you can't change it. So um, in many cases, uh, there are sometimes authoritative reports that are put out by, say, the World Bank, for example. And they might say, you know, uh, anybody can use this for free. Um, it's available, but you, we don't want it to be changed because this is a final report. Um, I, I uh, really try to steer people away from uh, no derivative works and try to steer people away from non-commercial when we're dealing with educational resources because, of course, no derivative works uh, would stop your ability to modify it and change it, which is less useful when you're talking about education. Uh, and non-commercial, there are just, frankly, um, many entities in the world that are commercial that are doing a lot of good um, in educational settings. In some cases, the only educational option uh, in a particular area is commercial. So I, I try to sort of keep people over on the, the attribution and on the share alike uh, best I can. That being said, we do have this fleet of licenses, and we, uh, we encourage folks to use the license that works best for them. So uh, before I continue, though, it's really some people are confused about Creative Commons, and I think that Creative Commons is copy left or that Creative Commons is fighting copyright somehow. And in fact, that couldn't be further from the truth. Creative Commons rides on top of copyright. In fact, if there was no copyright, there could be no Creative Commons, because Creative Commons licenses rely upon one's copyright and the ability to share. So, uh, so that's the good news, and that's the great thing about Creative Commons, is that nobody has to give up their copyright. In fact, we encourage you to keep your copyright, and please do not turn it over to, to publishers or to, uh, to, op to journals, for example. Journals uh, are notorious for asking authors to sign their copyright over. Don't do that. Uh, keep your copyright, put a Creative Commons license on your work, and then you can give others permissions uh, to use it at no cost and give them legal permissions. So why are Creative Commons licenses uh, so special? Well, one of the reasons is they come in these three uh, forms. So many of you are probably familiar with the, with the middle one, with the human readable uh, deed. So when you click on a Creative Commons license on the web, uh, maybe somebody could drop a, a URL in that's got a CC license on the bottom of the page. That'd be helpful. And if you click on that, it's going to take you to a human readable deed, which is great. It's, it's written in very simple language, and it says, you are free to do this under these conditions. So you are free to use this work, to perform it, et cetera. Under the following conditions, you have to give me attribution. Um, you cannot use this commercially. If you make changes, you have to share those changes forward, or whatever the conditions are that you chose. The, the, next, uh, the next one down is the legal code, of course, that all of our licenses are, are built by lawyers. They're right on top of copyright. So you want to know that if this goes to court, that you're going to be legally protected. And in fact, uh, every time Creative Commons licenses have gone to court, and they've gone several times, um, they have been upheld by courts around the world because they are rock-solid uh, legal licenses. So that's a good thing, and you should feel confident in your use of CC licenses. And in the top layer, what's called machine-readable, this is particularly important for us techies because um, we know that if there's machine-readable code on a digital work, that tools on the Internet can find it. Tools on the Internet can do something with it. So, for example, if you use a Creative Commons license, and you've got the machine-readable code in it, um, then you can do an advanced Google search, and your resource is more likely to surface in that Google search. Or if you, um, if you put something on Flickr, for example, um, it can be found by its license. So just a little bit about Creative Commons. There's the human-readable deed. This is probably what you're uh, used to seeing. Here's an example of the lawyer-readable re code, and then, of course, the machine-readable code. Uh, simple um, XML looks like this. So the licenses, of course, exist on this continuum uh, at the bottom, kind of least free, or I, I refer to it as fewest degrees of freedom for downstream users. And you move to the top, and you get kind of the most free. So we actually have tools, one, one's called CC0, where you can actually give up your copyright and put it directly into the public domain should you choose to do so. And most people don't. Most people will sit right down here at CC BY or in CC BY SA, which is good. Somebody asked at the beginning, uh, you know, are you a global organization or are you just a U.S. organization? In fact, we are a global organization and proud to be so. <clears throat> the licenses have been ported into 55 different legal jurisdictions around the world, and that is uh, growing rapidly, although we're um, in conversations right now with the global community 
about actually moving our licenses from version 3 to version 4, and hopefully, uh, if it works out, uh, doing away with the porting process so that we can just have one set of licenses that work internationally. Uh, there are over 500 million on what items on the web that have Creative Commons licenses on them, and this is growing fast. We already talked about Wikipedia being one of them. Flickr is a big adopter. The White House uh, uses CC BY licensing on all of its websites. But most importantly for education, we're really interested in what educational institutions are doing. So MIT OpenCourseWare being one of the most famous, you know, has its courses um, online and uh, available to anybody who wants uh, to use it. And this is a, this is a great thing. Um, the not just, um, so I'll talk about governments in just a minute, but it's not just uh, governments that are starting to implement open policies, but it's also the foundations. And the foundations essentially are saying, look, if you take our money, we want to make sure that, that our, our, our investment has as much impact as it can possibly have. So whatever you produce, we're going to ask you, in fact, we're going to require you to share what you build under a Creative Commons attribution license. And this is a very good thing, right, because then not just the, the one uh, school that got the Gates grant or got the Hewlett grant, it benefits from that grant, but in fact, all the rest of us can benefit as well. Of course, uh, the machine readable licenses make search and discovery better. We're actually working with, with the major search engines right now to enhance search and discovery capabilities. When something has an open license on it, um, of course, you get the legal right to modify it. Um, for example, uh, MIT OpenCourseWare courses, over 800 of those courses have been translated into languages other than English, and those folks didn't even have to ask MIT permission to do so because MIT used the Creative Commons license and expressly and explicitly told the rest of the world, you are free to use this and do what you want. Uh, of course, accessibility, another big issue. Um, we are notoriously bad, not we Creative Commons, but we, the global online uh, and e-learning community are notoriously bad at not paying enough attention to accessibility up front, and we tend to have to retrofit our works. Uh, when something is openly licensed, someone else can actually fix your errors for you, um, which, which not only your content errors, which we all make them, but also your accessibility errors. Customiz customization and affordability is absolutely uh, critical. Um, CK12, really great example here where they, they produce um, very high quality open textbooks for, uh, for K-12. They really focus uh, right now anyway in on kind of high school STEM uh, curriculum, uh, and they're now aligning that to the Common Core standards. Uh, they've already got math uh, 6 through 12 aligned to Common Core for the U.S. So great example, though, of you can go to a CK-12 textbook, and if you don't like it exactly the way it is, um, you, can, you can modify it. They've got a whole platform called Flexbooks where you can go in and not only move the chapters around, but you can, uh, you can take out content that you don't like or you can insert some of your, your own. Um, and this, this ability to not only customize, but uh, this ability to customize is absolutely critical because many people say, well, that book's not quite right. You know, I can't use it or I didn't build it, so, you know, it wasn't invented here. I'm not going to use it. The ability to, to, to just make some changes matters a lot to people. The example I always uh, use the Betty Crocker cook uh, or a Betty Crocker cake example. When Betty Crocker released their quick mix cakes originally, all you had to do was add water, and it was this tremendous flop. Nobody bought it, right? They, they were targeting, uh, you know, folks that wanted a really easy way to make a cake. They found that if they changed it, so that all you had to do was add some eggs and add some milk and the water, um, that it was a huge success. So what was the difference? Well, people got their hands on it and they made it theirs a little bit. Did it really change the outcome? Not so much in the case of the cake, but in the case of, uh, say, open textbooks or open courseware, yeah, you really are changing the outcomes. But, but that, that ability for people to get in and sort of remix and make it their own and add their own content is really important uh, for that sense of ownership. Okay, so so why why are we talking about open policies? Kind of what's the point? Well, first let's let's restate the policy. Publicly funded resources are openly licensed resources. So let me just take this. I'm going to put it right in the chat window so everybody's got it. I don't want anybody to forget it here. So there it is. That's our catchphrase for the rest of the day. And um, so why are we focusing on on uh, on this particular policy? Well, the answer is that 
that's where the money is stupid, right? So in public funding of education, that's where all the money is, right? It's not coming out of the foundations, and it's not coming out of people holding bake sales for their K-12 schools. It's coming out of taxpayer dollars and the states, at provinces, at national governments, um, where there's taxing authority, right? So we, 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 you and me, the citizens of whatever nation we're in, we pay taxes to the government. And what this chart shows is that governments around the world, doesn't matter what government you look at, they tend to spend somewhere between 5 and 6% of their GDP, their gross domestic product, on education. Now, of course, let me go ahead and move forward one slide here. And if you look globally, that number is just under $60 trillion a year for GDP. So you multiply, or you get to take 5% of that, you get just under $3 trillion a year. Well, that's a big number, right? $3 trillion is a big number. And how much of that is actually uh, courseware and buying textbooks? It's, it hovers somewhere between 10 and 15%, right? Most of the money is in salaries and benefits and capital costs and, and other parts of the budget. Uh, but somewhere between 10 and 15% is creation of educational materials, it's um, the, the accreditation of those materials, it's the production and the maintenance of those materials, it's the massive buys that K-12 and elementary education around the world make uh, for textbooks, it's the, the student debt that's serviced um, on when students are buying uh, textbooks and paying for their tuition. It's all these, these cost factors, and it's, it's not trillions of dollars that we're spending on those, those two bullets, but we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars a year globally. Okay, so there's, there's a significant amount of money. This is why we focus on open policies. And open policies are important because if we get this one simple idea right, if we get the idea that whenever something is paid for with public dollars, that it's freely and openly available to the people that paid for it, then sustainability of open educational resources frankly ceases to be an issue because, A, there's plenty of public money to build and maintain all the teaching and learning resources that the world needs if we openly license it. And, B, open becomes the default when you're dealing with public funds and closed becomes the exception. And the bar for receiving an exception should be very high. So I think we need to reframe the way that we think about the conversation of sustainability. The, the old frame, the existing frame, most people say, well, that OER project over there, that pilot, um, how are you going to sustain that, right? It's something new. It's not part of our core budget. Gosh, we've got hard budget times. We either have to keep that OER program or we're going to fire two teachers. What's the decision going to be? I would argue fundamentally that's the wrong frame. I would say the right frame is, um, in quoting my friend Wayne McIntosh from New Zealand, Wayne would say, uh, what are we, what are we, what are we supposed to be doing? Well, we're educational institutions. What does that mean? Well, it means that we're about sharing knowledge. It means we're about teaching. It means we're about helping other people learn. It means that we've got missions about moving fields and knowledge forward. Well, okay, if that's what we're supposed to be doing, then shouldn't we be using these tools that we have, the Internet, the affordances of digital things, open licensing, to maximize our missions and our capability to share knowledge and to push our fields forward. Most reasonable people would say yes. And then further, if you walk up to a citizen on the street and say, by the way, do you know that your taxpayer dollars paid for that university to build those courses or paid for those students to get financial aid to buy those textbooks that are having to get bought year after year after year, and your tax dollars, um, A, are being wasted on some very bad business models, but most importantly, what you are directly paying for, you don't have access to. Do you think that's right? Most people will say, no, I, if I paid for it, I should, get, I should get access to it. So I argue that the new uh, really form of sustainability or the new formula of sustainability is that sustaining OER really is the same as sustaining the academy, right? If we are going to, if we're in the business of producing, sharing knowledge, uh, and maintaining it and keeping it better, then we'd better be using these, uh, these tools to, to be as efficient as we possibly can be with the public tax dollar. Now, let me be clear. I'm not advocating for universal curriculum or one-size-fits-all textbooks or courseware. Quite the opposite. <clears throat> In fact, those of you who are open advocates know 
openness is not about mandating a single thing. Openness is about option and choice and sharing and making new derivative works of other people's works. It's about variety. When you deal in openness, you deal with the long tail of content. <clears throat> so the good news is that this policy is simple to say, and it's easy and simple to convince impartial policy actors of its obviousness. Again, the, po the policy publicly funded resources are open educational resources. So what's the implementation of this? It's real simple. We get policies and legislation in place that says if you use public funds, that, that stuff either is openly licensed or it's put directly in the public domain. And the open license that's used, that's chosen by the government, by the state, by the policy, by the system, by the institution, is a license that allows reuse, revision, remix, and redistribution. Right? And that's not all the Creative Commons licenses, but it certainly is CC BY and, and CC BY uh, SA and the MC clause even works as well. So, again, we've got some fun slogans for this. We can use slogans like David Wiley uses, like buy one, get one. I bought it, I should get access. My favorite is you should get what you pay for. You paid for the darn thing, you should get access to it. And, of course, public access to publicly funded resources. And the good news is that this is very easy to convince policymakers to adopt open policies because the arguments for doing so are simple and they are compelling. So if you walk up to any legislator, I don't care what country you're in or what state you're in, and you ask them these three questions. Do you want efficient use of the public funds? Do you want to save students money when they're going to college? Uh, and do you want to increase access to education? Most people are going to say yes. I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, Social Democrat, Liberal Democrat, you know, uh, Tea Party member, pick your, actually the Tea Party loves this stuff because it's efficient use of government funds. Uh, I don't care what your political ilk is, um, this argument tends to ring true with pretty much everybody. And then you get, it, you get that'll get you in the door, and then you start um, probing a little bit about which open argument is going to work best with whoever you're sitting down with. And I found that if you just sit and listen, that there's some, one of these arguments work with everybody. Because all of them want public tax dollars to be used wisely and efficiently, but one of these arguments is going to work. So uh, affordability. You know, everybody wants students to be able to afford college and afford textbooks. And the moment you start talking about open textbooks and how you can reduce students' costs from $1,000 a year U.S. to something much, much less, you've got their interest. Um, when you're talking with faculty, faculty tend to understand that the more eyes on the problem, the more chance there is for a solution. Faculty tend to buy into the idea that the academy is about sharing knowledge and reviewing other people's works and giving credit, right? This is what they do. This is what we all do in the academy. In fact, um, you know, this is just sort of second nature to us, but the fact that OER and, and the technology and open licensing, it's all kind of come on so fast, it's just a bit of a shock to our systems, and we have to kind of sit down and process it. But the good news is the base is there. We understand this in education. This is what we do as educators. And, of course, the last one is equally as important, right? This is a social justice issue. If we have this learning machine and the marginal cost of turning it on is close to zero, then do we have an ethical and moral obligation to do so? And I would argue that we do. So what's possible with open policies? Well, again, quite simply, there are massive amounts of public education and scientific resources available that we, the taxpayers, pay for. And if we put them under an open license or put them in the public domain, then we all have access to it. So the European Commission, just using one example, spent $638 billion on basic and applied research and development in 2001. The United States, through NSF and NIH and a couple other agencies, spends $60 billion a year on scientific research grants. Now, let's pause for a minute. Where does that money go? So, A, that's your money. So, and I know not all of you are from America, but, but most of you are. You paid for that $60 billion a year, and so did I, in our federal taxes. So, we paid for it. We should get access to it as sort of the starting point. But let's set that aside and look at what exists today. So today, we pay for the $60 billion. The, the money goes out in grants, usually to R1 universities, Research One universities. The universities get all that money, which is fine. They're doing all the research. They get all the money, but they also get the copyright. Right? There's no requirement that they share. And then what do those universities do? They sell it, usually, to some company. They do technology transfer. They make more money you know, millions of dollars more in many cases 
and and we the public then have to buy whatever the the product of that research is from that company. Now I'm not trying to close that company out of business, and I'm not trying to stop the university from getting grants. All I'm saying is that's a really stupid model, I and mean, it's a bad deal for us, the taxpayers, right? So a better model would be for NSF to give that multi-million dollar grant to, say, the University of Washington and say, here, University of Washington, here's $5 million to go work on curing cancer. Whatever data you produce, whatever research you produce out of it, whatever journal articles you produce, you know, six months after publication, 12 months after publication, you must put a Creative Commons attribution on the work because this was produced with public funds. You don't like those terms, don't take the grant. Then, of course, you know, University of Washington can still sell it, do technology transfer. That company that buys it can still take it to market and sell it to us. That's all fine. But as taxpayers, we should get access to that first round of work that we pay for. Let me give you another example. Textbooks, as you all know, are very, very expensive. And if you run the numbers, uh, it doesn't matter what country in the world you look at. We all teach roughly the same highest enrolled courses in our higher education systems. We all teach Psychology 101. We all teach Sociology 101. We all teach Political Science. Yes, the curriculum is slightly different, et cetera. Um, but largely, a lot of the concepts, a lot of the core competencies are very, very similar. So one question would be, you know, let me just use the, the United States as an example. Could five states get together and say, you know what, our highest enrolled course, and let me just go ahead and go to the next slide here. So in Washington's community colleges, just community colleges, right? I'm not even talking about the universities. So just in the community colleges where we've got 500,000 students in the state of Washington, and we're a small state, right? So we're not anywhere near as big as California or Ohio or anybody else. Just our state, these numbers are actually low. Um, it's now uh, somewhere between 55 and 60,000 students a year take English 101, okay? English composition. Everybody takes it, all freshmen take it, community colleges, universities, I don't care where you are in the world, you take some kind of writing composition course. We've got 55,000 students a year taking that course, and let's be uber conservative and call it a $100 textbook. The actual average cost of the top 50 textbooks that are sold in your college bookstores has hit approximately $176. So if you use that number, the total amount is not 5.5, but it's about $8.25 million every year. So what does that mean? That means that just one system, just community colleges in the state of Washington, are spending somewhere between five and a half and eight million dollars a year buying one book for one course, and they're spending that year after year after year. Now let's break this down. Where's this money coming from? Well, these are community college students. So they don't have a lot of money, so what do they get? They get a ton of financial aid. Where's the financial aid coming from? State tax dollars and federal tax dollars. Is there a better way to do this? Could, could Washington State launch a textbook RFP for, I mean, let's spend a boatload of money. Let's spend two million bucks. So we're going to put out state money, $2 million, RFP. Anybody can reply. So Pearson, McGraw, Cengage, uh, my friend Steve Hardigan, who writes great textbooks, anybody can reply for this $2 million bid, and we'll give you a half million dollars a year to keep that textbook updated. Anybody interested? I bet we get a lot of people interested. Now, here's the shift. The state of Washington is going to keep the copyright. We don't give up the copyright, and we're going to put a Creative Commons attribution license on the thing so anybody else in the world can use it for free. You don't like the way our textbook is formatted? No problem. It's got a Creative Commons license on it. Modify it. Translate it into different languages. Do whatever you want. Why would Washington want to share with the rest of y'all? Because we're hoping that uh, California will produce Sociology 101 and put a CC license on it. And we're going to talk to California about that. We're going to pick up the phone and call our friends in Poland and our friends in Croatia, and we're going to say, what are your highest enrolled courses? Hey, would you guys chew on political science? Because we don't have a, a really good uh, Eastern European political science module for our political science textbook. So you build that. You build yours. We'll build ours. And you can take part of ours, and we'll take part of yours. And nobody changes any money. Everything's CC by but we're all sharing, right? And then the collective costs, we don't do this anymore 
to our students, which is absolutely ridiculous. And I would argue borders on insane behavior, and most of us should be committed if we continue this kind of bad behavior. So the good news is that there are new models that are emerging um, that are, in fact, leveraging um, uh, the affordances of digital works, uh, the Internet, and they are showing us how to get to this dream where everybody can have access to an affordable, high-quality education. WGU has dropped the concept of seat time. They've moved to competency-based education. Their full-time tuition is uh, $6,000 a year, which is uh, very, very low when you look at uh, four-year degrees. Um, and they're now moving into states. They're already across the United States, but they've got special presences in, uh, in Texas and in, uh, Indiana and in Washington State, where I live. Um, and they're really breaking the mold in several ways, but still pretty traditional as far as being an online university. Some of the other ones that are more radical would be uh, like peer-to-peer -peer university uh, and badges, the concept of, I don't know if any of you were Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, but I was a Boy Scout and I had, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I got it right here. I got props. Here we go. See, my mother put this in plastic for me. I'll hold this up so you can see it, right? So here's my badges when I was a Boy Scout. And you could actually look. Let me go put this down. My mother would be upset if I get it all wrinkled. But you can actually look at my badges, and you can see the discrete competencies that I achieved, and you can pretty well see, yeah, the guy knows how to make a fire, he can set up a tent, and I know that sort of the accreditation behind this, the Boy Scouts have actually tested him and assessed him. That's what the concept of badges is, but not for Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, but for, uh, for jobs, right, for careers. And uh, Mozilla is getting behind this. And so, yeah, there's a badge for that, right? <laughs> That's going to be the new catchphrase. And, in fact, uh, Creative Commons is partnering with Peer-to-Peer -Peer University and several other open organizations to build a school of open uh, in Peer-to-Peer -Peer University. So that should be a lot of fun. We're going to start that in 2012. Another one is University of the People. Concept here is anybody in the world has the right to learn. And these folks are using uh, open educational resources. And they, in fact, have faculty from around the world who are donating their time. I mean, it's a brilliant model. Uh, the guy's name is Shai. He's coming out of Israel and doing really fantastic work. Another one, which I think is, I, I just can't say enough good things about, is OER University. Um, this is coming out of, this is Wayne McIntosh out of New Zealand uh, and the Commonwealth of Learning. And the OER Foundation is building this. And essentially, the concept is students are going to learn all over the place. They're going to learn in community colleges and universities. They're going to learn in internships and apprenticeships. They're going to learn sitting home at their computer watching TED Talks. They're going to learn walking down the street talking to people. But sooner or later, they need a place to come, and they need to be assessed, and they need to get credit. And so the idea is what OER University is doing is they're setting up anchor institutions around the world where when you're a student, you say, you know, I, gosh, I really kind of know what I'm doing here, but I need somebody to, to test me and assess me and then uh, give me academic credit. And I can go to a place, and they'll provide those services at cost. And I think there are up to 13 anchor institutions around the world who are willing to provide those services at cost. And, of course, the learning that's going to happen out in the open that OER University provides um, and that others provide using open resources is available to anybody um, at no cost. Uh, and let me just say, here's a list of their founding partners, although this is out of date because more and more uh, colleges are signing up all the time. Uh, there are countries that are quite a bit ahead of others. And um, uh, the Netherlands is one. Uh, if you haven't seen their WikiWise program, I would strongly uh, recommend taking a look at it. Um, it's a program by the, uh, launched by the Dutch Ministry of Education to stimulate the development and use of OER, to improve access uh, to open uh, materials, and to support teachers and faculty um, as they engage OER and, and make it better. And there are just lots of other examples. Brazil is launching legislation right now that requires that government-funded educational resources be made widely, widely available to the public under an open license. So if you work for the government in Brazil and you build something, because you're paid by tax dollars, what you build will have an open license on it. 
Uh, Poland right now is working on legislation around public K-12 textbooks because in Poland today, the parents have to buy the textbooks for the kids, and so you got kids sitting in the classroom. Some of them have textbooks. Some of them don't have textbooks because the cost of textbooks is just under what, it, what the minimum wage is in Poland. And so you can either choose to pay rent or you can buy textbooks for your kids. What are you going to do? Right? It's, a, it's a lousy deal. And so they're, they're starting to look at open educational resources as a way to provide equitable access to K-12 textbooks. Right? I mean, this is, a, this is serious stuff. Uh, Athabasca University has a policy in Canada that says, faculty, before you build a new course, before you go buy something off the shelf or you build something new, you first need to go out and search for published open educational resources to see what else is out there. Doesn't mean you have to use it. You just got to go look, right? Okay, so, so lots of opportunities, right? But change is hard, right? And existing structures are difficult to change. And most education content business models are built on gatekeeping and locking up resources to make them rivalrous. Remember that concept of rivalrous versus non-rivalrous. And they're very challenged by these trends that we're talking about, screwing up their business models. And so the existing business models are starting to fight. And they've got money and they've got lobbyists. And they're, they're, uh, they're, they're coming after these ideas because we're threatening their 70% profit margins at the, uh, at the uh, peer-reviewed journals. We're threatening uh, the $20 billion a year textbook market, um, K-20, in the United States of America. And while I, I feel for them, and I, nothing, none of this is about taking down any particular business model, uh, frankly, our answer should be, we don't care. And the reason we should say we don't care is we care about students. We care about people being able to learn. We care about uh, effective and efficient use of our limited taxpayer dollars. And we, fair, we care about everybody in the world having the right to an education so that they can have a better life than they would have without it, right? That's what we care about. And if there are existing business models that are unable to adapt fast enough to assist with those goals, then frankly, they need to get out of the way. Okay, so here's an example, a recent example of how they're starting to fight. So the U.S. Uh, House Appropriations Committee recently released this draft of this 2012 funding bill. This is in the U.S. Congress, right? And if you read it, it essentially says, if you take a Department of Labor grant, so the context here is the Department of Labor put out a $2 billion grant for community colleges in the U.S. to build new state-of-the-art programs to help people get jobs, right, to put people back to work in healthcare and aerospace and advanced manufacturing and green technologies, all these great fields that are emerging. And community colleges got, got grant money to do this. Well, Department of Labor said, hey, this is public money. You should share what you build. If you build something with public funds, you're going to put a Creative Commons attribution license on it. Right on, right? That's the right public policy. Well, the, uh, you know, several of the existing business interests feel very threatened by this, and so they put this into, uh, into the bill. And if you read it, it says you can't build anything until you've done a complete market analysis. So, uh, so uh, Shoreline Community College, if you've got a new developmental math program that raises completion rates by 45%, and, boy, you've really hit – You've really hit, hit it on the money. And what you need is a grant from the Department of Labor in the next wave to take it to the next level, to share it with everybody in the world so that everybody can be successful with developmental math. This law would say, um, I'm sorry, you're first going to go have to look and see if anybody sells anything about developmental math. And, oh, look, there's Pearson. They sell a developmental math. You have to buy that. And even if nobody built or currently has anything about developmental math, Pearson or McGraw or somebody could come forward and say, oh, well, hold on a second. We're building that. That's in process. You can't build anything Shoreline Community College. That's what this legislation says. So just think about that. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen Saturday Night Live when there's really with Seth and Amy. That was sort of my reaction to this. I was like, really? Really? As public taxpayers, not only are we not allowed to get access to what we paid for, but now you're not even going to let me build anything with taxpayer money? Uh, it just, um, I mean, this just uh, sort of smacks of uh, protectionism and lack of innovation and protecting uh, massive profit margins, if you ask me. So, um, so what does our strategy look like? And let me 
I'm noting the time here. I'm uh, rapidly running out of time, so let me um, advance through the slides here quickly. Um, this is important. Most policymakers still think in these terms, and the terms are uh, commonly referred to as the iron triangle, and it looks like this. So you sit down with most educational, I don't care if it's if you're elementary, you're talking to a principal, or you're in a university or community college or whatever. Um, most of them think in these terms, um, that there's this iron triangle and there's tension between the ability to raise access, to raise quality, and to keep costs low. And if you look at the bottom three bullets here, uh, you see the, the tension that, that uh, most people think about. And while this is absolutely true and there are, um, there are reasons for this tension to exist, um, if you start to deal with non-rivalrous resources, if you start to deal with open textbooks and open courseware and open data and open science, in fact, you can break the iron triangle uh, in many ways. So a couple closing slides. I say because we know all of this, we collectively, those of us in this room, have a responsibility to think bigger and to make smarter decisions collectively. So why do I have Lincoln up on the screen? Well, in, in December 1st, 1862, one month before he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln sent a long message to the U.S. Congress. And in it, he said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. As the occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so must we think and act anew. And we must disenthrall ourselves and then we shall save our country. And so I think the question to us today is, can we disenthrall ourselves from our current behaviors, from the current business models, from our current practices, so that we can think and, in fact, act anew? And I believe that we can. We ought to be straight and honest and uh, direct about the flow of the money. Uh, we ought uh, make sure we ought make our open policy arguments uh, directly and convince others of their of how rational they are, and we should force the opposition to make their best arguments and be ready to counter them quickly. And what's important for all of you to know is that you don't stand alone in these efforts. The open community is powerful. It is strong. Creative Commons is at your back on all these conversations. So if you find yourself in these conversations and you need talking points, you need strategies, you pick up the phone and you call me and we'll assist. So in the end, again, back to first principles, only one thing matters, right? And you need to take policymakers back to these first two principles. Only one thing matters to them, efficient use of public funds to increase student success and access to quality educational materials. And everything else doesn't matter. Everything else is secondary. Don't let anybody throw a red herring into the mix. If something's getting away in this first bullet point, then it's obstructing the ability for folks to get an education that it no longer belongs in our education setting. So what's the end game here? The winning argument that we have is that policymakers will want the highest return on investment and the highest impact of public investments. So our open policy goal should be that we get open policies adopted by all nations, all national and state agencies, all provinces, all systems of education, all educational institutions, departments, and at the individual creator level. We need individuals uh, openly licensing their works as well. So of all the images in today's talk, this is the only two that I actually took. Um, so let me take us back. Do you remember the food machine that we started with? Unfortunately, we don't have such a device. And while we might have the global capacity to feed everybody, unfortunately, food is not digital and is, and is still a rivalrous good. And so universal access to food is still a significant challenge which is a shame because many people in the world, as we discussed, don't have nearly enough food to eat. But if we did have a food machine, we would turn it on tomorrow. There's simply no question about it because the moral imperative to do so would overwhelm any opposition. We do have a learning machine, as we've discussed today. We simply need to turn it on. And moreover, because we understand the tools and the strategy, I contend that we have the moral and the ethical responsibility to act. We're off to a good start. Open policies are the next step. Uh, remember, public access to publicly funded educational resources. Buy one, get one. I should get what I paid for. And if we're smart, anybody in the world can share.
If you're interested in these ideas, Creative Commons stands ready to partner with anybody who wishes to implement open policies. And a final thought for the 21st century, the, open, the opposite of open is not closed. The opposite of open is broken. Thanks very much. There's my uh, Twitter feed if you want to follow me there. Um, if you want to uh, see my blog, I didn't put it up on the screen, but um, I will put it in the chat window in just a minute. And I'll turn it back over to Steve. Thank you so much, Cable. I love this presentation. I'm so delighted you've given it. Uh, though my only disappointment is that we have one minute to go, and we have to make sure people can get to the next set of sessions. So we're just going to thank you. Unfortunately, we'll skip the Q&A, but that was a terrific session. We really appreciate your being part of the conference. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, here's the, there's my blog I just dropped in the window and uh, Twitter feeds at C Green. And again, those slides, if you'd like them, are at slideshare.net uh, slash C Green. They're downloadable. They've got a CC BY license on it. Uh, get out there and get these discussions going. First thing you can do is to openly license your creative works. Um, it's very easy to do. It's free. Um, and I wish you a good conference. Thanks very much.